And greetings. Welcome to the house of God. It has been said, home is where the heart is. God is always where the heart is. Um, so even though you are not here with us in our sanctuary, we have learned that the house of God is your house, my house, the neighbor's house. Wherever you are and, where, and whenever you tune in to this online worship service, open your heart. Know that God is there and always will be there. Let Christ in with his joy and love. Just a reminder, the Department of Health, Minnesota Conference of U, uh, United Methodist Church, are asking us to be extra careful this coming weeks and take extra steps in protecting us all. Please, and I repeat, please remember if you enter the church to wear a mask, um, and maybe wherever you go, let's get started with that. And you know, it's the twinkles in your eyes that know that you're, um, you're there to greet people, um, share your love and the love of Christ. Let's begin today's worship with song. we gaze on your kingly brightness so our faces display your light 
likeness ever changing from glory to glory mirrored here may our lives tell the story shine on me shine on me And now our call to worship. Come, Lord God, and be with us in these moments. Too often our cares and our worries distract us from you. Come, Lord God, and speak words of comfort to your troubled people. Help us hear you, Lord God, in the quietness of these moments. And please join me in our opening prayer. Creator God, in the beginning, your word subdued the chaos, and in the fullness of time, you sent Jesus, your son, to rebuke the forces of evil and to make all things new. By that same power, we ask that you transform our fear into faith, that we may have courage to follow in the way of your kingdom, through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Story for all ages. Stregonona. Last week, if you remember, Pastor Deborah talked about the yeast in her bread making and how it bubbled and gurgled and kept going everywhere. And no matter how hard she tried, she just couldn't stop it. Well, I related this to God and God's love for all of us and how, you know, it just keeps bubbling and growing and we can't stop it. It's there for us. In today's story of all eight, in today's story of Steg Strega, uh, Streganona, um, Big Anthony has trouble stopping the magic pot of hers. In it, um, pasta just goes everywhere. And so, kind of like God's love is just everywhere, we can't stop it. Um, I hope you enjoy this story. And at the end, just like Pastor, Pastor Gary's going to be talking about, will it hurt? We'll see if it hurts Big Anthony in the end. Streganona. Uh, a original tale written and illustrated by one of my favorite favorite authors and illustrators, Tommy DePaula. Isn't that just beautiful? I just love his artwork. There she is, Streganona. In the town in Italy a long time ago, there lived an old lady who everyone called Streganona, which meant Grandma Witch. Although the people in the town talked about her in whispers, they all went to see her if they had troubles, even the priests and the sisters of the convent, because Streganona had a magic touch. She could cure a headache with oil, water, and a hairpin. She could spread special potions, um, excuse me, she, couldn't, she made up these special potions for girls who wanted a husband. And she was very good at getting rid of warts. But Streganona was getting old and needed some help to keep her little house and garden. So she put up a sign in the town square. Big Anthony, who really doesn't pay attention, went to see her. Anthony, said Streganona, you must sweep the house and wash the dishes. You must weed the garden and pick the vegetables. You must feed the goat and milk her. And you must fetch some water. For this I will give you three coins and a place to sleep and food to eat. Oh, gracias, said Big Anthony. The one thing you must never do, though, she said, is to touch the pasta pot. It is very valuable, and I don't let anyone touch it. Oh, see, yes, said Big Anthony. 
And so the days went by, and Big Anthony did the work, and Stregonona met with people who came to see her for headaches and husbands and warts. Big Anthony had a nice bed to sleep in, next to the goat shed, and he had food to eat. One evening, when Big Anthony was milking the goat, he heard Stregonona singing. Peeking in the window, he saw Stregonona standing over the pasta pot. She sang, Bubble, bubble, pasta pot, Boil me up some pasta nice and hot. I'm hungry and it's time to sup, Boil enough pasta to fill me up. The pasta pot began to bubble and boil, and suddenly there was steaming hot pasta. Then she sang, Enough, enough pasta pot, I have pasta nice and hot, So simmer down my pasta, My pot of clay, Until I'm hungry another day. How wonderful, thought Big Anthony. That's a magic pot for sure. And Stregonona called Big Anthony in for supper. But too bad for Big for Big Anthony, because he didn't see Stregonona blow the three kisses to the magic pasta pot. And this is what happened. The next day, when Big Anthony went to the town square to fetch the water, he told everyone about the pasta pot. And naturally, everyone laughed at him because it sounded so silly, a pot that cooked all by itself. You better go and confess to the priest, Big Anthony, they said. Such a lie. Big Anthony was angry. That wasn't a very good thing to be. I'll show them, he said. Someday I'll get that pasta pot and make it cook. Then they'll all be sorry. The day came sooner than even Big Anthony would have thought, because two days later, Stregonona said to Big Anthony, Anthony, I am going over the mountains to see my friend Strega Amelia. Sweep the house, weed the garden, feed the goat, milk her, and for your lunch there will be bread and cheese in the cupboard. And remember, don't touch the pasta pot. Oh, yes, yes, Strega Nona, Big Anthony said, but inside he was thinking, this is my chance. As soon as Stregonona was out of sight, Big Anthony went inside, pulled the pasta pot off the shelf, and put it on the floor. Now let's see if I can remember those words, said Big Anthony. And Big Anthony sang, Bubble, bubble, pasta pot, boil me up some pasta, mm, nice and hot. I'm hungry, and it's time for a sup, boil enough pasta to fill me up. And sure enough, the pasta pot pot bubbled and boiled and began to fill up with pasta. Aha! Big Anthony ran to the town square, jumped on the fountain, and shouted, Everyone, get forks and plates, platters and bowls, pasta for all at Stregonona's house. Big Anthony has made the magic pot work. Of course, everyone laughed, but ran home to get their forks and plates and platters and bowls. And sure enough, when they got to Stregonona, the pot was so full, it was beginning to overflow. Big Anthony was a hero. He scooped up the pasta and filled the plates and platters and bowls. There was more than enough for all the townspeople, including the priests and the sisters of the convent. And some people came back for seconds and third helpings. But the pot never was empty. And when they had their fill, Big Anthony sang the song. Enough, enough, my pasta pot. I have my pasta nice and hot. So simmer down my pot of clay until I'm hungry another day. But alas, he did not throw the three kisses. He went outside to the applause of the crowd. Big Anthony took his bow. He was so busy listening to compliments from everyone that he didn't notice the pasta pot was still bubbling and boiling until a sister from the convent said, um, Big Anthony, look, 
The pasta was pouring out of the pot all over the floor of Strigonona's house and was coming out the door. Big Anthony rushed in and shouted at the pot those magic words once again. He took the pot off the floor, but the pasta kept on pouring from it. Big Anthony grabbed the cover and put it on the pot and sat on it. But the pasta raised the cover and Big, and Big Anthony as well and spilled on the floor of Streganona's house. Stop! Stop! yelled Big Anthony. But the pasta did not stop. And if someone hadn't grabbed poor Big Anthony, the pasta would have covered him up. The pasta had all but filled the little house. Out of the windows and through the doors came the pasta, and the pot kept right on boiling. The townspeople began to worry. Do something, Big Anthony. Big Anthony sang the magic song again, but without the three kisses, it was no good. By the time the pasta was on, by this time the pasta was on the way down the road, and all the people were running to keep ahead of it. Whoa. We must protect the town from pasta, shouted the mayor. Get mattresses, tables, doors, anything to make a, bro a blockade. <laughs> but even that didn't work. The pot kept bubbling, and the pasta kept coming. We are lost, said the people of the town, and the priest and the sisters of the convict began praying. The pasta will cover the town, they cried. And it certainly would have if it hadn't been for Streganona, who had just returned from her visit. She didn't need to look twice to know what was happening. She sang the magic song and did, you know, the three kisses. The pasta pot stopped sputtering and the pasta came to a halt. Oh, gracias, thank you, thank you, Streganona, the people cried. But then they turned to, uh, to poor Big Anthony. String him up, said the crowd. Now, now, said Streganona, the punishment must fit the crime. And she took a fork from the lady standing nearby and held it to Big Anthony. All right, Anthony, you wanted pasta from my magic pot, she said. And I want to sleep in my little bed tonight. So start eating. <laughs> Will it hurt? Anthony started eating. Poor big Anthony. We can't stop the love of God. But Streganona can stop the pasta with three kisses. Blessings. Some, somewhere morning. Hang on. <laughs> I'll just. Oh, uh -huh.
It's from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 14, beginning with verse 25. Hear these words as I read them to you. Now large crowds were traveling with him, and he turned to and said to them, Whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even life itself, cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not first sit down and estimate the cost, to see whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who will see it will begin to ridicule him, saying, This fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king? going out to wage war against another king, will not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to oppose the one who comes against him with 20,000. If he cannot, then, while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for the terms of peace. So, therefore, none of you can become my disciple if you do not give up all your possessions. Here ends the reading. From God's holy word. Would you pray with me, please? O oh Lord, we pray that as you are our rock and our redeemer, that you'll come into our minds and into our hearts and have us hear what you want us to hear and do what you want us to do. Amen. Well, Jesus, no 21st century Christian in his or her right mind is going to hear your words this week and jump for joy. Let me start out by asking you folks a few questions. First, let's say that your, your little boy or girl comes running up to you with a cut on their knee, a nice bleeding alley get the bleeding under control, you wash it with soap and water, but you want to disinfect it before you put on that big bright band-aid. You get out the bottle of disinfectant, and your little boy or girl, still snuffling up tears, asks, will it hurt? What do you tell them? Do you lie and tell them no? only to have them scream and shock and betrayal when it does sting? Do you tell them the truth and say, yes, risking that they'll pull away and run off in order to avoid the pain? Or do you say to them, we just won't do this part, and then let them run off to play again while you put the unused bottle of disinfectant away? What do you say? Now, let's imagine that you've been asked to speak 
at an orientation meeting of new church members. After you describe why you became a member of Detroit Lakes United Methodist Church and why you're glad you did, someone asks, is it hard to be a Christian? What do you say? Do you answer, no, all you have to do is stand up in front during a worship service and answer a few questions and then maybe serve on a committee once in a while and bring a few bars to a potluck? You don't even have to teach Sunday school if you don't want to. Or do you say, yes, it can be very hard, and you go on to share some of the expectations Jesus has for those persons who follow him, including expectations such as those mentioned in today's Bible lesson. And you realize that if you take this option and say yes, you risk scaring this potential member away into the arms of a less scary congregation. What do you say? Some 80 years ago, the German theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote a book titled The Cost of Discipleship. He noted that the problem of Christianity could be summed up with the metaphor of God's grace being sold in the marketplace. People, being goods and consumers, prefer cheap grace. Something that doesn't ask too much of them. Something that doesn't cost them too much. Costly grace is something else entirely. In one place, Bonhoeffer wrote, When Christ calls a person, he bids them come and die. In today's Bible passage, Jesus demanded three commitments of loyalty from his followers. When hanging on to your possessions gets in the way of your attachment to Jesus, you must choose Jesus over your possessions. When your loyalty to any other person conflicts with your loyalty to Jesus, you must choose Jesus even over your own family members. When you are faced with the ultimate choice between hanging on to your life and remaining loyal to Jesus, you must choose Jesus over keeping your life. These are hard words. And other demands on our commitment and our loyalty show up elsewhere in the New Testament. Will following Jesus hurt? It might. We are called upon to follow Jesus even if and when we find it hurts us in our creature comforts. It hurts us in our way of life. It hurts us in our pocketbooks. It hurts us in our relationships with friends and family. It even hurts us in our personal safety and security. Jesus does not hide any of the fine print from us. He wants us to count the cost before we make any commitment to buy into following him. Yet we would do well to remember that the same Jesus who warns us about the costliness of following him to the cross is the same Jesus who promises us the victory of the empty grave. Back before Will Williman was a United Methodist Bishop, he was Dean of the Chapel at Duke University. One day he got a call from a very irate father who began the conversation with, I hold you personally responsible for this. What the father was so upset about was that his graduating daughter who had previously been bound for graduate study in engineering, was going to, to throw it all away, as the father called it, and go do mission work with the Methodists in Haiti. Isn't that absurd, shouted the father, a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from Duke, and she's going to dig ditches in Haiti. Woodman responded, 
Well, I doubt that she has received much training in the engineering department here for that kind of work, but she's probably a fast learner and will probably get the hang of ditch digging within a few months. Look, the father said, this is no laughing matter. You are completely irresponsible to have encouraged her to do this. I hold you personally responsible. As the conversation went on, Dr. Willman pointed out that the well-meaning, but obviously unprepared parents were the ones who had started rolling this ball down this particular hill. They were the ones who had taken her to be baptized. They had read Bible stories to her. They took her to Sunday school. They let her go on skiing trips with the United Methodist Youth Fellowship. Willeman said, you're the ones who introduced her to Jesus, not me. And the father said, but all we ever wanted her to be was a Methodist. Let us pray. Gracious Lord Jesus, be with us as we read and understand the fine print about what it will cost us to follow you. Help us to understand that we might well get hurt because we follow you. We ask that you be with us and help us through the hurt when that happens. Most of all, help us to be faithful in following you. Amen. As we think about how we want to pray this week and, and what we want to pray for, take out a sheet of paper or a piece of paper, scrap paper, and something to write with. And write down on that slip of paper one thing that makes it hard for you to be a Christian. One thing that makes it hard for you to be a Christian. And today, during this week, pray about that one thing. Pray about it today and throughout the week. As we approach our prayer time together, think about the prayers that you do want to offer for yourself and for others. If you have journey notes handy, you might want to take a look at that and see the names of persons there who we ask prayers for. Let us be in an attitude of prayer. Gracious Lord, giver of life, you have breathed into us your creative, joyful spirit. You have lifted us from the dust into the swirling joy of your presence. We are so grateful for all that you have done for us. Each day, remind us in many ways of your mercy and your love. Yet there are times in our lives when we have felt lost and alone. We have been hurt and frightened and wondered where you were. Remind us again of your loving presence. Place your hands of healing on our lives. Comfort us when we become afraid, lost, lonely, and fearful. Prepare us to serve you faithfully all our days. As we lift the names of dear ones to you, who are in need of your healing love, cause us to reflect on our needs for your love and our response and dedicated service to you. Be with us now in this time and place and in all the places and times of our lives. We pray in Jesus' name and we pray now as he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please keep the following people in your prayers this week. Pastor Chris, Pastor Brenda and Tom, Betty, Jan, Steve and Nancy, Bob and Gwen, Amanda, Michael, Nels, Nelma and family, and Shelley Masteller and family on the passing of her mom this past week. 
And this week we celebrate with the following people. Happy birthday to Tova, Tyler, Cheryl, Nathan, Sarah, Oliver, and Greg. And happy anniversary to Hans and Sue, Steve and Shar, Rod and Carol, Buck and Marilyn, and John and Karen. Both our secretary, Ellen Kensinger, and our custodian, Cindy Sauer, will be leaving us at the end of this week. So you all are invited to a farewell get-together this coming Wednesday, the 29th, from 3 to 5 p.m. here at the church. We're hoping for a nice day so that you can thank them for their years of service and wish them well outside in our parking lot. It won't be a drive-through deal like Pastor Brenda's farewell. You'll be able to park in the parking lot, um, and they will be on the sidewalk out front of the church so that you can walk up to them and visit a bit. If it does decide to rain, we will hold this event inside of the church, so come no matter what the weather is up to that day, Wednesday the 29th from 3 to 5 p.m. And as always, you can mail in your offering to the church building at 885 Pembina Trail, or you can continue giving online through our website at www.dlumc.org. now the benediction. May the grace and peace that comes from our God who creates, redeems, and sustains be with you this day and forevermore. Amen.